Hi, what's up, y'all? It's Poppin' What's Cracking It's Steve Boss here, X, because I've been preaching about this how the most insane trial just ended. Full recap, Young Thug. So people were telling me to react to this video because they said that ABBA broke it down really well about the details of the case and, you know, what's been happening with Young Thug. Uh, they said it's really interesting. So, yeah, let's hear what he has to say. Let's watch. He just ends up looking so f stupid because now Jeffrey Williams, Young Thug, walks free today, is just on probation, and he was facing 25 to 40 years in jail. This is the longest court case in Georgia's history. Oh. The most expensive ever, costing tens of millions of taxpayer money. Oh. And they got this guy on f probation. And I really don't want to believe that it is purposeful, but honestly, after a certain number of times, you start to wonder how it could be anything but that, unless it is just that you are so unorganized that you are throwing this case together as you try it all right today's topic the Ooh. most insane court case i have ever witnessed just ended right now one of the most famous and prominent rappers in the game young thug has just been released on probation now you might be thinking why do we care because this trial i've been following it it is the longest trial that georgia has ever seen it is a rico trial basically a racketeering trial against a gang and Young Thug and the gang were Can facing gang. 45 to life in prison. Some insane life sentences for potential murders, uh, racketeering, drug charge, everything you could imagine. So why is this interesting? I'm telling you guys, this trial was so insane. And I, it was being live streamed the whole time. They're going to make Netflix series about this 1,000%. Mm. This had multiple judges thrown off the case uh this had drugs being passed to people inside a court caught on camera the young thug rico case has taken by most accounts an Wait, unusual I twist this. an alleged drug deal in open court prosecutors say they have the video to prove it yeah this that had corruption so at the highest level it. and it just ended in the most insane way where to start okay the da's office in Georgia is seen as incredibly corrupt. If you aren't aware, Fonnie Willis is the one who's going after Trump uh, for what he did in regards to the election. And there's a lot of things surrounding her and how poorly she runs her stuff. The allegations stem largely from a contentious divorce involving a key prosecutor in the Trump election interference case. Nathan Wade's estranged wife accused him of having an affair with DA Fonnie Willis. While at the same time, Will is paying him $650,000 so far to run point on the high-profile racketeering investigation. I, actually, I think she's already been, she's already had one scandal involving a love affair, if I remember correctly. She's up for re-election, and she wanted to get this case out of the way because it's been running for over two years. Which, when you get a jury in, and you're trying, normally, most trials, you're looking at anywhere from like a week to like two, three months. This is two years. Mm. So let's go back. Jury's brought in, they figure this stuff out. We got the first judge who is Ural Granville. And from the onset of the case, everything is a mess. The case is moving slow. The state has like a hundred plus witnesses. They're bringing witnesses back after they've already been on the stand. Everything mm. is super confusing and the judge is not controlling it. The defense and the prosecution are going after each other, accusing each other of withholding evidence. It is, if, if, if you were just a third party observer watching the live stream and this is your first time seeing anything in court, you were like, oh, we're in a third world country. That's how crazy things were. Then you have one incident where somebody seemingly tries to hand drugs to one of the defendants. But the place where this trial got international claim and became a big deal was when the prosecution and the judge decided to have an ex parte meeting in their chambers with a sworn in witness, okay? Now this witness, for context, was a key witness for the state. They did not want to testify. They wanted to plead the fifth with men. They didn't want to incriminate their stuff. They didn't want to talk. And they were now going into the judge's chamber with the prosecution without the defense's knowledge. The defense ends up finding out about it. And what they're alleging they've learned about the meeting is that essentially, one, it was improper. Two, they were trying to coerce the witnesses to testify. Three, the judge was in helping the prosecution to make this shit happen. So they go into open court and Brian Steele calls out the judge in front of everybody. The judge loses it. And what I found out just recently, this is not waived, is that um, supposedly on recorded times, district attorney or district attorneys from the DA's office as well as investigators, sheriff deputies, Mr. Copeland and his counsel 
uh, met together. None of the defense team, to my knowledge, was aware that this was going on. It was told, based upon information belief, that they were told to the, the district attorneys that Mr. Copeland intended to plead the Fifth Amendment. To me, that never... Mr. 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 can I interrupt you for just a second? I'm kind of disturbed because that's ex parte. This, All that was an ex parte conversation. How did you find out about any of that? Well, I'm not disturbed too. And the reason well, I, I'm asking you a question, I, 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 I didn't find out about, about it. Well, listen, if you don't tell me how you got this information, then you and I are going to have some problems. We can have it. I have problems right now. Okay, I, 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 look, I don't, I don't want to know about your problems, okay, at this point in time. How about Mr. Copeland, who supposedly announced he's not testifying and he'll sit for two years and then supposedly in that dishonorable court, okay. or excuse me, let me rephrase that this court supposedly said, I can hold you until the end of this trial. Ms. Hilton supposedly said actually all of the defendants and then all 26 people are disposed of. If that's true, what this is, is coercion, witness intimidation, ex parte communications that we have a constitutional right to be present for. So I understand that you're upset towards me, but Ms. I know what I did. Mr. Steele, I, I still want to know, you. how did you come upon this information? Who told you? What I want to know is why who was I there? You? Why, sir, I'm going to hold you in contempt if you don't tell me who this, I'm not, I tell, don't, me, tell me who this information is. I don't want to be held in contempt. Well, then answer that question. I'm going to give you five minutes. If you don't tell me, don't have to. If you don't, don't tell me who it is, I'm going to put you. I'm, me, I'm, I'm going to put you in contempt I because understand. he jails the lawyer for one of the defense. Then the entire bar, which is like the Association for Lawyers in Atlanta, find out they all show up at the courthouse. Mr. Steele, I am going to hold you under, um, still hold you in summary criminal contempt. Not the decision many in the courtroom were expecting. I was surprised by a couple of things. First, that the judge held him in contempt. About a dozen defense attorneys showed up to support Brian Steele, who's representing rapper Young Thug in his criminal racketeering case. Anytime a member or a criminal defense lawyer is making a motion in good faith and they're being shut down by the judge and threatened with jail, that's scary. The reason Steele was held in contempt by Judge Ural Glanville? The judge was having ex parte communications with the district attorney and a witness. That means he was talking to the district attorney and the witness without anyone from the defense being present. And that is generally considered improper. So Mr. Steele found out about that. He made a motion for a mistrial and the judge demanded that Mr. Steele reveal that source. Steele's punishment? I'm gonna order that yeah. you be taken into custody, uh, incarcerated in Fulton County Jail for more, no more than 20 days for this contempt. Those 20 days consisting of every weekend for the next 10 weekends. I think it went well. I mean, it, you know, anytime you walk out of court with your client, um, that is a good thing. Um, and I do think that the appellate courts will take interest in this and will probably be able to overturn it. But they decide to get this judge recused, which basically means the judge is not impartial. Um, he cannot be the judge for this case. That's what they claim. And it gets given, it ends up being approved, not for the ex parte meeting, but because the judge was arguing with the defense when. If someone's saying you're impartial, you have to fire it up to another judge to determine. Like, if you're accused of being biased, you can't be the sole determiner of whether or not you're biased. So they <laughs> fire it up to another judge, that judge makes a determination. And we have breaking news in the YSL trial. Fulton County Chief Superior Court Judge Ural Glanville has been removed from this case. So then they're like, okay, trial's on hold. We got to get a second judge. The next judge comes in. And then she's like, I can't take this case. I think... Uh, don't quote me on this. I think one of my officers ended up one of the defendants, which is like, what the fuck is happening? So she gets removed off the case. Breaking news right now in the YSL RICO trial involving Atlanta rapper Young Thug. And less than 24 hours after replacing the original judge, the newly appointed judge has recused herself. Judge Shakura Ingram was randomly selected to lead the trial after the former judge, Euro Glanville, was removed apart, yesterday. Eh? Ingram says she is removing herself from the case due to a prior professional relationship with a deputy involved in the case. So then there's a third person that gets put on, and that's where we are with Judge Whitaker. New at four, a newly appointed judge took the bench today in the Young Thug Rico trial. Judge Paige Whitaker is the third judge assigned to the lengthy court case. She sees the case and she's like, yo, this is a mess. You guys have been going for a year. You have no idea how to litigate this. She's yelling at this Kate state a bunch of times. And, and to be fair, she did go after the defense at some points where they were being, you know, overindulging in certain things. But repeatedly throughout the time that she oversaw the case, she kept scolding the state, saying, you guys are disorganized. How is this case happening? All right, a couple of matters. First of all, Miss Love, 
That needs to be the absolute last time that you don't have enough witnesses to carry us at least until five. And if it happens again and there is something less than an earthquake, an eight-car pileup, somebody died, three people died, and so none of the witnesses were available, yes. I may just say you can't have that witness because at this point in this incredibly long trial, to have to end at 425 is not a good use of anybody's time. Do you understand? I do. All right. Your Honor. And so I said we, to you, is any of it hearsay, is any of it being offered for the truth? And you said no. And then you turned around, you drew the witness's attention to the phone number and tried to have the witness testify to whose phone number it was. If that is not offered for the truth, what is it? I mean, I can't figure out what oh, it she is. she put them in a place. If it's disingenuous, if it is that, I mean, I don't, I don't want to malign the prosecutor standing in front of me right now. So I'm not going to say the possible things that it could be, but it is baffling to me that somebody with the number of years of experience that you have time after time after time continues to seemingly purposefully hide the ball to the extent you possibly can for mm. as long as you possibly can. Mm. And I really don't want to believe that it is purposeful, but honestly, after a certain number of times, you start to wonder how it could be anything but that, unless it is just that you are so unorganized that you are throwing this case together as you try it. And I am sorry to say that, but Somebody. this case is being made much more difficult for everybody because of the haphazard way in which it is being presented. And you have to keep in mind, Jeez. the case is trying to prove a conspiracy, but everything is confusing. All the witnesses are either non-cooperative or not very useful, and there's just, it's a big web, but you have no idea how it connects. You can imagine the judge was up to her last, and, and you know, the defense was constantly asking for a mistrial. These, these people don't know what they're doing. They're trying to go into a mistrial. They're breaking the rules of evidence. The judge denies all the mistrials with prejudice. If I could tell you guys just how much craziness happened in this case, there was one detective who came up, and basically he's an expert in testifying these cases, but he did something you weren't supposed to. He mentioned the fact that one of the defendants had a criminal, cr criminal history. Now, you might not understand, but you cannot use someone's past criminal acts, generally speaking, as character evidence in a case because mm -hmm. it biases the jury to think that person's always going to be a criminal. And that's not how you should be judged solely on the merit of the charges against you, not whatever prior convictions you have. So this officer did that and he got thrown off the case. The judge said, no, he's out, he can't come back. The state was upset. But now we get to the most recent incident which led to this trial pretty much ending. There's a witness that comes up and he's basically snitching on everyone and said, yes, it's a gang, okay? He's admitting that as part of his plea so he doesn't go to jail, he's admitting everything is a gang. And they're asking him to read Instagram posts. And the defense objects, and they said, hey, this is going to prejudice my client. Redacted. The state agrees. So they take the same exhibit. They hand it to the witness. All right? And then they ask the witness to read off the exhibit. The witness reads through the post. Then he reads through the hashtags. And one of the hashtags is the one that they objected to already in defense. And the state agreed to redact. But on the exhibit that they gave to the witness, they never redacted it. So this guy starts reading, and she goes, keep reading. The guy keeps reading, and now we get to the part. And then she tells him, yeah, read that part too. And he reads it. Immediately, the defense loses it. The objections come up. They ask for a mistrial. The judge screams at the state. And she says something that I think is highly inappropriate. She essentially says. And then is there a hashtag? Hashtag, no slime left behind. Hashtag, two Bs, life size. And is there another hashtag? Free Quay. What? Is there another hashtag on the screen? Oh, no. Your Honor. It's in this paper Your right Honor. You got me reading. Your Honor, I need, I have to make a motion. 
Your Honor, we're making a motion for a mistrial on behalf of Mr. Nichols. So what's the poster referencing? I don't honestly really care what the poster was referencing. What I'm trying to do is fix your sloppiness so that everybody won't have wasted, you know, 10, 12 months of their lives in this trial. That's not a judge's job. A job should be impartial. But you can see that she's seen how much time. I don't want everyone's time, the jury's time, to be wasted because you guys don't know how to run your case. The defense asked for mistrial with prejudice. And just to make the distinction, with prejudice means that the state cannot retry the case. Without prejudice means that the state can retry. So the judge is like, I'm not going to give you guys a mistrial with prejudice, but I will give you one without prejudice. So I'm going to deny a motion for a mistrial with prejudice. That one, I don't believe that the facts bear out. Would you like a mistrial without prejudice? Yes. You would? Who else would? Even the camera work is a mess. <laughs> and then that means, of course, that the state would be change. free to try every one of y'all again. I don't remember. But now she was saying, I will end this case if it's just what you guys really want. And I think this was her way of saying, guys, come to some plea agreements because I'm almost done with these people. And the state sees this too. Court is adjourned. About five to six days go by. Everyone's negotiating. The defendants are negotiating with the prosecutors to make you guys understand how crazy this is. Two of the defendants that were being charged with murder, multiple murders, and life sentences, they were given eight years with time served. They're looking at maybe four or five at most. So they're going to be out of jail in a few years. That's how incompetent they were. And that's the kind of deal they had to come down to. M multiple murders is what they were facing, multiple life sentences potentially. And they were getting off with three to five years with the time they've already got served. Wow. So those defendants... Oh, they about to commit crime again, for sure, for sure. And then we come to Young Thug, which was today. This makes more Young sense. Young Thug was also facing Wild 25 years like this. to <laughs> whatever else. They go through their deliberations, and this is where the state is really disgusting, even in their closing argument. They're doing what's called a uh, non-negotiated plea deal. And what that means is the state and the defense haven't come to terms on a set amount of years to give the person who's getting the plea deal. They're gonna leave it up to the judge. The state gets to make their case for why they think the person should get a bunch of years. The defense gets to make their case, but essentially the plaintiff is now making an admission to some of the charges. They're saying, I'm guilty of some of this. Judge, I leave it in your hands. How much time do you think I should serve? The state goes up and they start chatting nonsense about why this person deserves 25 years. They start mentioning rap lyrics. So, oh, this person said this and this person said that. The music, Your Honor, contained lyrics such as the following. I rep my life for real, for slimes, you know I kill. I'm in the VIP, I got the pistol on my hip, fuck the police. <laughs> You praying that you live, I'm praying that I hit. This is slime shit. A hundred rounds in a Tahoe, I'm prepared to take them down. Got banana clips. But then when you look into the lyrics that they're referencing, they're not even lyrics that Young Thug sang. Wow. They were lyrics that other people, Nicki Minaj and other artists that sang, or other people had written. And so they were trying to attribute to him some level of guilt. They also were using lyrics and claiming these were about gang-related activities and, and specific murders. But in reality, these lyrics were written before the murders ever happened. Mm. The defense attorney, Brian Steele, on retort, ends up bringing up a lot of this stuff. He kind of explains how they're misrepresenting a lot of the evidence in their closing statements. The state has no idea when these lyrics were made. Some of them were made before the shooting of Donovan Thomas that the state is saying this applies to Donovan Thomas killing with the Tahoe. They are so far afield of where we need to be when we are trying to, God forbid, take somebody's liberty. Your Honor, the state is talking about things like F the judge and I rep my life for real. That's not even said by Mr. Williams, but they don't care to find out. They are on a tunnel vision to try to convict a man. Then he brings up the most important key that I think changed everything. He tells the judge, 
when we were negotiating with the state originally, they were going to give him probation as long as he testified and he admitted that he was the leader of the gang and that he admitted that he did a lot of this stuff. Young Thug refused. He said, I'm not going to admit I was the leader of a gang because I wasn't. And I'm not going to admit to... But the state offered him 15 years on probation. But they keep piling on these conditions. He just said, he made up his mind. He said, I'm just going to go with it. I got to get home. Judge may not let me home, but I'm not doing these conditions and admit that I'm the leader and I'm involved in... So then they're like, fine, then we want you to spend 25 years in prison. And he's like, judge, if they thought my client was a real danger, why would this single admission be the difference between him going to jail for 25 years and him going free today? And the judge took note of that. All right. So it is not um, lost on the court that the state, had they been able to come to agreement on certain special conditions, was willing to entirely dismiss the RICO count, was willing to entirely dismiss one of the gang counts, and was willing to entirely dismiss this, you know, machine gun count, Um, was willing to give a sentence that permitted Mr. Williams to walk out of the door today and therefore does not seem to be particularly worried that Mr. Williams, if on the streets, would be a danger to society. Uh, I'm taking that into consideration and crafting my sentence. The state just ends up looking so fucking stupid because now Jeffrey Williams, young thug, walks free today, is just on probation, and he was facing 25 to 40 years in jail. This is the longest court case in Georgia's history, the most expensive ever, costing tens of millions of taxpayer money, and they got this guy on fucking probation. And the truth of the matter is, a lot of people are saying they should have never pled out. You know, they were winning the case, and the truth is the defense was winning the case by a landslide. But the defendants have already been in jail for multiple years now, waiting through this trial to end. They had no bond, they weren't seeing their friends and family, and they were just stuck in a prison cell, and they were tired. They just wanted this to end. So Thug took a chance, and honestly, in my head, I don't think he should have taken it, but I'm not him. I can understand why he did, and it ended up well. I just think he was gambling a lot more than I would have been comfortable with, but I understand it. The courts really are sometimes a bit of a circus in some places. The way that some district attorneys decide, and this is a very unethical district attorney's office, the way that they ran this case, the way that they engaged in conversation with people, and I think the judge was also wrong for not granting a mistrial with prejudice because the state had made so many like disgusting mistakes and they always said, well, the, the judge would say, you know, I'm not granting it with prejudice because I don't think this was on purpose, it was a mistake. I think they're just bad at their job. And I'm like, well, if someone's life was on the line, mm. should you not grant the mistrial with prejudice because a certain pattern of repeated mistakes that well, right, shows that these people, people don't have the aptitude to decide whether or not, or to influence whether or not this man is going to go to jail for life. Exactly. You know? Or these men... I'm not group. saying Thug is innocent, obviously, but, you know, their incompetence can cause many <laughs> people who are innocent to go to jail or vice versa. you letting people off or people end up getting off because you don't know how to do your job well. But people, so uh, I was hooked on this case. I was watching it for Which a very long time. Which just got off. It <laughs> was just probation. If you see people you know plead, job well. if you some, see some people with felony convictions, <laughs> sometimes this, the courts will just railroad you. These people were so hot and heavy to get Young Thug that they were letting murderers go. They were letting other kinds mm-hmm. of criminals go. But they wanted the big name so bad, they didn't care who they let out in the streets. Wow. And they were willing to do every unethical thing possible to make sure it happened. And when you it see that kind happen. of court case unfold, it's hard not to look at the justice system and say, it's my fun. faith is yeah, I knew that. You know, yeah, I knew it's that. hard to look at, I mean, I'm not gonna say I have that much faith to begin with, but yeah, district attorneys like these, the way that they ran their show, the fact that this was live streamed, I think was amazing, because it let the audience know just how fucked up courts can be. Maybe I don't care, maybe you do, but no, I do want to talk about this because I was consumed by this case and I just couldn't believe that this case was more absurd than any form of television I'd seen mm-hmm. when it came to TV court trials. Truth is stranger than fiction sometimes, my friends. 
This is a wild. I definitely want to see a documentary about this in the future because what the hell? I want them to put all the pieces together so that I can, you know, see the evidence <laughs> of the nonsense that took place. I mean, he did a good job putting clips together, but, you know, a documentary, they're going to put it together even even nicer, you know, present it in, 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 a, in a really dope fashion. So I definitely want to see this on somebody's Netflix, Hulu, or whatever. But, yeah, he got out because they wasn't doing their job correctly so we'll, we'll see what he ends up doing i you know already reacted to the video where he already told me yeah let's put these rats in their place like what <laughs> sir you probably shouldn't have shouldn't have gotten out with this attitude anyway y'all let me know what y'all think though let me know what other videos you've been watching i'll see y'all the next time bye